Thank you so much. And uh, I think we're all really excited and eager to get started on talking about AI ethics and about the various ways that we each approach it in our respective fields. So with that, I thought for all of you, it might be useful to start by just by setting some groundwork on what it is we're actually talking about when we talk about AI ethics, right? Like, what, what does that entail? Um, so I, I wanted to just kind of level set with one of my favorite definitions or approaches to it, and then I want to throw it open for anyone who's got their own favorite interpretation or way to frame the discussion. I like to quote uh, Reed Blackman. I don't know how many of you have run across his work, um, but he has a book uh, called Machine Ethics, I think, or something like that, uh, and he likes to distinguish between um, AI for good and AI for not bad. And I think that's a really brilliant distinction. Uh, we all know that, I think we all know, I assume you, you uh, are aware that AI could be used in really useful and constructive ways and we can scale incredibly meaningful projects with it. We can think of it in alignment with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, for example, and think about how we can uh, curb hunger, how we could remove plastics, how we could make solar panels more efficient, and, and that sort of thing. That's all true, but that is much more on the AI for good side than it is on the AI for not bad side. The AI for not bad side is much more about how do we think about business and government and all of the sort of mundane, usual types of ways that technology is deployed in ways that we are not scaling unintended consequences that are harmful to people, that are uh, bringing about things that we don't intend to have happen, that are exposing us to more risk inside of business, and that are making things more dangerous for us inside business to deal with on a legal basis, on a financial basis, a reputational basis, and that we have uh, sort of technical debt and, and debt that we'll have to come back and, and correct before the next generations of technology or projects get out there. So that's a starting point. Maybe I'd throw it open to all of you. You're all a brilliant group who have a lot of different perspectives. Anybody want to just jump right up on your microphone and share a perspective that you, uh, a definition or an approach that you like to frame AI ethics from? So I'd just like to say one thing. I always get really uncomfortable, and I don't know about the rest of you, when it comes to this idea of ethics. Because I always want to ask the question, ethics for whom? Yeah. Ethics for whom? So I like to think of it more in terms of responsible technology and with the understanding that we're all kind of stakeholders in this, all of us together, whether you actually work in AI or not. Um, that's my perspective. I would love to hear from the rest of you. For me, it basically comes down to the idea of who do you get to sue and why? Because like, <laughs> I'm a lawyer, lawyers love suing people, it's what makes us like, gets us up in the morning, helps us get to sleep at night, like do it early and often. No, but part of why I come back to the AI litigation part of this is I think that the discussion around AI ethics, AI bias. AI harms has rapidly outpaced the discussion about how you actually operationalize a lot of the corrective measures against that. And the reason we sue people isn't just for the fun, but because that <laughs> is a way is of internalizing the costs of the harmful actions that people have. When a product fails, when someone is hurt, when there is bias, when there are all of these externalities, if you don't have litigation as a way to internalize those costs, people just keep doing bad things. And so for me, it's much more a question of how do we make sure that our you know, actual legal system, that our regulatory system, that all of these other uh, sort of pieces of social infrastructure keep pace with the discussion about ethics, bias, and inequality. Anything else anyone wants to add on that? Well, I think a lot about the question of equity and whether this technology could end up taking power from the hands of the few and putting it into the hands of even fewer. Mm. Or, more optimistically, could this be a democratizing technology which creates broad opportunity and helps tackle inequality? And I think which direction it goes in depends a lot on policies of government, including local government, and something I'm thinking a great deal about. 
Sounds like a really good segue for us. So we had been queued up to talk about uh, some of the policies and approaches that we're all in uh, talking about at the city level, at the state level. I know last night, uh, Julia, we were talking about the EU AI Act. So I'd love for us to just get some context on some of these different strata that, that, that we're approaching the legislation and regulations from. Uh, maybe we can start at the city level. Could you go ahead and talk us through the, at the AI approach that, that you're taking at the city level? Sure. You know, though from, from a regulatory perspective, the, the real powers at the level of the federal government, for sure, um, to some extent the state government, and maybe even internationally. I think at, at the city level, uh, our power our, and our influence derives first from the size of government. We're a $110 billion government with a $2 billion IT budget and decisions we make on what kind of systems to buy and what standards we expect can actually move the market. Certainly the questions of inequality I addressed before are going to be determined by whether we get our act together in educating young people, whether we transform uh, workforce development. Uh, a lot of these systems have to be dragged from the early 20th century up to today and we're very, very far behind on that. And then, and finally, at the local level, um, I have enormous concern about election integrity. Actually, more than my concerns about elections at the national level, because, you know, if if Trump or one of those crazies generates um, false content, misleading content, there's a whole national press corps that's going to be out there litigating that and calling them out on that. But in a busy election year in New York City alone, we could have. 400 campaigns, and nobody has the bandwidth, no, no journalistic operations monitoring every piece of so social media or hard copy mail or phone message coming out from those campaigns. Um, I think that's got to be a role for government. Uh, we have something called the Campaign Finance Board in New York, which does have a very robust program for managing campaign contributions and spending. And I think they need to establish rules by yesterday that any AI-generated content must be, be clearly labeled uh, as such, um, and, and other rules that, that right now are not in place. And um, we have a state election cycle coming up. We have a primary in June. We have a, a big election year coming up in 2025 at the municipal level, and we are way behind on getting those protections in place. And if I could just add on the city government, because Mark has done exceptional work actually talking about ways you can have safeguards, but when you, when you look at what has happened at the mayoral level, so we had our first report in New York City on how to protect the public from you know, problematic uses of AI back in 2019. And it was setting out all these great principles and nothing happened. None of them were implemented. None of them actually led to real safeguards. And when you saw the most recent round of AI ethics washing coming from this current mayor, he, at that same press conference, announced that he had been using AI to create deep fakes of himself, speaking languages he doesn't know, to do outreach calls to New Yorkers, creating the impression that he spoke more than 20 different languages, which goes not just to this question of, like, why is that good value for money, but even the election integrity, because there's a big impact when you're running for office and people think that you've taken the time to learn their language, to be a part of their community. And, and so I really think that New York has had this tremendous opportunity to be a leader in this space. And sadly, when it comes to real safeguards, we, we've really fallen behind. That's an interesting perspective, too. And, and I wanted to uh, segue to the state level as well. Elon, can you walk us through a little bit about what's going on there? Absolutely. I just want to start off by saying um, I'm with Senator Gonzalez's office, but any of the statements I make today are my own. Um, they might be broadly consistent with the senator, but I just want to be clear that any of the statements that I, that I make are my own tonight. Uh, He's so also not going to accept your bribes if you try. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so um, I would say in the state, uh, a lot of the policies have been around promoting the business interests of, of AI companies. So um, I think the state of the state has been has created a lot of the movement around some of the AI policies that we see coming out in the state. Uh, the governor announced a four hundred dollar million, uh, four hundred million dollar uh, Empire AI plan 
that would depend on a mix of public and private funds that would, uh, that would build up an AI infrastructure in the state with very lofty um, public benefit goals. Um, it remains to be seen how these will be enforced. Um, this is kind of the, the carrot, I would say, that exists in the state right now. Um, as also, as another part of her state of the state um, AI agenda, the governor released um, AI rules for ITS, which is the central agency in the state that basically operates all of the, all the technology infrastructure. And these are some of the first rules that we've seen in the state that really govern the way um, tech, uh, AI technologies are used um, in state government. Um, we want to see more being done, um, but we are, we're, we're, you know, we, we'd like the, the momentum that the state has and the amount of attention that this, that this issue area is getting in the state, and we'd like to see you know, more robust regulation being passed uh, in the current session. I'm guessing that many of you in the projects that you're launching uh, are probably thinking about national operations or maybe international operations, and so it may be useful to think, too, about any kind of federal level of AI regulation or international. And Juliet, I think you're probably most focused on that. I'd love to have your perspective on what you see happening nationally, internationally, with these various AI packages that are, that are coming up. I think that many people that uh, have been observing from the outside feel that the, the United States is playing catch up in a lot of ways, uh, especially to the EU. The Artificial Intelligence Act uh, coming out of the EU has now been ratified, which you know, a lot of people have been talking about because it affects us directly, whether we realize it or not, right here in the United States. Ultimately, if there are any European citizens' data uh, which has been included in the training data of what, uh, whatever AI uh, case you are utilizing, deploying, developing, then this affects you directly. I like the risk-based approach that we've seen so far that we are not necessarily looking at here in the United States, at least not from the same perspective. And what I think is really interesting, though, in terms of commonalities, is that we are relying heavily here in the United States um, on self-regulation by big tech to a certain extent, to do self-audits and self-assessments. As part of the AIA, the Artificial Intelligence Act of the EU, there's also a lot of uh, reliance on that ability to self-regulate, the sandboxes, especially for the most advanced artificial intelligence. And I can tell you, and it's quite ironic because I get to say this sitting right here at Columbia where I did my dissertation. My dissertation was on the limits and possibilities of self-regulation in artificial intelligence. I studied this for four years intensely. And I can tell you, I mean, I, I studied it from here to Finland. I've really tried to look at the various models around the world. And honestly, self-regulation does not work. And part of that problem is the fact that I think that most people that, that start as entrepreneurs in tech really want to do great things with the world, right? We, we have all of these possibilities. And look, if we just throw the right technology at this or collect the right data or find the right model, we can do anything. We can change the world. And I, I honestly believe that we can. But the realities of the market, the realities of um, what actually happens when you have a startup, you need funding, right? Most of the funding that's coming out <laughs> is coming out from the government. And the government has a prime directive of making, uh, of essentially capturing AI supremacy by 2025 before the Chinese do. This has been a, a race that's been happening in the background. And I think that overall, we need to decide as human beings whether we want to develop this technology and deploy it at the service of the human race or of the tech race or even of the arms race. Because right now, we're doing all three, and none of it is actually landing, I think, in, in the most optimal way. So. I think you've struck the core of AI and ethics, oh. right? It's, it's, it's very clear how we can use these technologies to accelerate business processes and, and monetize these technologies. It's going to take something more to get us to slow down and make sure that, they're, that, that, that they are safe technologies and non-discriminatory technologies. And I'd love, Christy, I'd love to have you weigh in from the entrepreneurial and VC perspective, too, because that seems like the approach that many folks in the room are probably going to be thinking most about, is how do we have a, a healthy relationship as entrepreneurs with this ecosystem, with the regulatory space, and how do we think from a, um, an innovative perspective around that? What's, what's the approach there? 
Yeah, there are multiple lenses by which I can answer this question. So I'll choose two, and then I'll sort of lay it out from the standpoint of the strategy, tactical, and then how does ethics relate to those two. So um, I'm an engineer uh, and um, have worked at Apple and, uh, and Google in particular, Waymo. And so the lens that I look at it from is from a robotics, which um, a lot of large language model, let alone computer vision, machine learning, you can list out all of the different analytic approaches um, you know, we're at the, the core of that. Um, and, you know, when we talk about AI and then we talk about ethics, I love the fact that you mentioned let's really hone in on sharpen the pencil with regards to what does ethics mean. I think it's also important to weigh in on what does AI mean mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. understanding weak AI versus strong AI. To be clear, just because I qualified it with weak doesn't mean that it doesn't have potency in that. So. You can kind of think of you know, the utopian view as well as the dystopian view, right? We can look at it in the extremes. The reality is, is that we're at the middle of the spectrum. We have to understand what weak AI is, automating smaller tasks to make lives easier, but to what cause and effect? Strong AI, everyone has possibly seen Wally, right? <laughs> he, he's able to adopt and adapt, learn to love, learn to care, this empathetic AI. There's a utopian view of that. There's also a dystopian view of that. Now, if we look at it through the lens of robotics, autonomous vehicles inspired by government, funded by government for good, to protect us, not only domestically, but overseas. The DARPA Grand Challenge was sort of the birth of autonomous vehicles. Now we see autonomous vehicles in our very streets. They're making decisions at some point that says, how do I evade this object? How do I detect that object? And at some point in time, how do I save lives or the alternative? So I always like to think about AI as a system, right? Making decisions. And if I gave you a box that you know I put oranges in, well, the likelihood of you thinking you're gonna pick up an orange when you go into that box, it's pretty high, right? Now, if I mix it with oranges and bananas, you're going to say, maybe I'll get an orange, maybe I'll get a banana. But long story short is, if I put spoiled food, garbage in, well, guess what? You're going to get garbage <laughs> out. So thinking about what data, it's not just the governance and infrastructure. It's who's looking at the data, who's seeing and assessing the importance of that data, and looking ahead and reasoning back to understand you know, what's that causality. So hopefully I answered your question. And in terms of the entrepreneur, I mean, the raison d'etre of the entrepreneur is to make something possible by which you think is impossible, right? The whole think different uh, from Steve Jobs. And um, looking at it with a critical lens, ensuring that there's not only ethnically diverse, but different ideas of different shapes and sizes at the table and getting the seat at the table to, you know, we can't guarantee that we're free from bias because the, the reality is we're, we're biased, right? In our infrastructure as people. Um, but at the very least, to have that you know, scrutiny in that critical eye, that's important when I think about it from the entrepreneurial lens versus being part of autonomy and robotics and bringing you know, sensors to life like many of you are holding in your hands, possibly, like the iPhone. I'd love to actually uh, go beyond, too, you talked about autonomous vehicles and robotics. I'd love to dig into a little bit of surveillance, because I know that's a, a particularly hot topic uh, for some of the folks on this panel and probably relates to some of the projects that you all are ta taking on. Uh, you know, computer vision is going to be a relevant piece, I would imagine, in many of your projects or in uh, data that you inherit into your projects. Uh, and and facial whether that's facial recognition or you know other kinds of computer vision, um, there's an awful lot of uh, productivity systems within the workforce that are all about you know whether you're uh, logged into a system that's keeping track of whether you're at your desk and what your keystrokes are and whether your mouse is moving and that sort of thing. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of surveillance, and so I actually would love Albert for you to walk us through a little bit of of what you're seeing in terms of the um, the ecosystem around surveillance and what the regulatory reaction or legislative reaction to that is right now, and how you think that folks in the room should be thinking about that in a, in a productive Albert way. Albert needs two hours for that answer. Yeah, yeah, I, I've interviewed him. I know. I, I, yeah. We're we're going to do a guided meditation through every nightmare you've ever had and every science fiction movie you've ever seen. No, but I mean the. 
second question is the easiest because when you look at the regulatory response, there is none. Mm. You know, it's the Wild West. We see self-regulation by police departments mm. to pick whatever technologies they want, to use that in, to arrest people to, as part of their investigation. And you see it being used for pretrial detention. And then oftentimes this evidence isn't even going before the courts. And so what you see is this complete systemic failure to actually have a chance through criminal discovery, through civil discovery, through, through litigation, through procurement process to have real accountability. And with the vast majority of the AI tools we see being deployed in policing, the first argument I make to lawmakers isn't that these are biased tools, they are. It isn't that these are you know, harmful to our civil rights, though clearly they have been. The first argument I tend to make is, there's no evidence that these work. And there's a lot of evidence that a lot of these systems actually don't. So you know, facial recognition is a example where we already see a lot of wrongful arrests because people are being matched to photographs taken in low light, at a weird angle, under suboptimal positions. And so people think, oh, facial recognition works on my phone, therefore it's gonna work with CCTV footage. But the image quality, lighting, all these things matter. And so you see people being arrested based off of systems that can have just abysmal accuracy scores. And when we ask the NYPD for their data on the accuracy and bias of their facial recognition system, which has been in deployment for over a decade, they said, sorry, we're not gonna give you those documents. Not because they're confidential, but because they don't exist. They said under oath they don't track the accuracy of these systems at all. And when you see systems like ShotSpotter, the AI-enabled audio, you know, audio tool that uses directional microphone arrays that are overwhelmingly installed in uh, public housing as a way to automatically detect when a gunshot goes off, you know, the, the people who make this technology say, oh, this is a great way to get objective data on the number of gunshots going off in the community. And when Chicago looked at the data, they said 90% of these uh, gunshot alerts were false. 90% of the time, there is no evidence that a gunshot went off. And so you have a system which, you know, you think, oh, it's audio analysis. How could that be biased? You know, it, you know, how could an audio device take into account the race of whoever's near by? But if you're putting it in overwhelmingly BIPOC communities, if you have it then leading to more police encounters, if you have officers running with their guns drawn to the site of a shooting that didn't happen, looking for a gunman who doesn't exist, treating whoever they see nearby as a threat, well, then you have examples like Adam Toledo, the 12-year-old boy who was shot in Chicago by officers killed when they were responding to a fake gun uh, a shot spotter alert. And, and I think that is where we are right now, where it really is hundreds of millions of dollars in New York alone, maybe even billions being spent on AI-enabled surveillance systems. And we don't have a single case study or bit of peer-reviewed evidence to substantiate the efficacy of any of, any of these systems in improving public safety. And we wouldn't accept that for government procurement in any other area of life. That's fantastic. Uh, Juliet, I know I wanted to turn it over to you for a moment because I know, first of all, I know that you're going to have to leave us a little early. Um, and unfortunately, we have to let Juliet go. Uh, but uh, Juliet's the author of a book called The AI Dilemma, right? Um, and I just want to—I want to ask you, uh, you know, maybe on this surveillance topic, but open it up a little broader. What do you see right now as the most um, sort of important or emerging threat or issue that we need to be thinking about when it comes to AI and framing this ethics or responsibility? conversation? I think it really depends on uh, which shoes you're wearing at that particular mm -hmm. moment. And I, I do believe that, you know, it's great to have your own personal opinion, but I also think that for us to be able to create better systems for more people and better regulation for more people, uh, that it's that we keep in mind other logic. So I tend to inhabit kind of the engineer's logic where I really like simplicity, efficiency. I like tools that work. Um, but I'm also the CEO of a company. And yes, I want my customers to be happy. And of course, I want to monetize as much as possible. And so I get to be, you know, prime capitalist at the table. And then I also happen to be 
you know, one of the people that if, if you were taking facial recognition, for example, I might be more prone to be targeted simply because traditionally it doesn't work as well on people uh, of my particular skin tone and even worse if I was darker, uh, even worse if I was, you know, an older person or a, a very, very young person. It's gotten a lot better, mm -hmm. of course, uh, but we still have a long way to go. There's a huge, huge gap there. And so I think that it's really important that we, we also keep in mind that, you know, as much as government is there to protect citizens, it has to deploy surveillance to be able to find bad actors, both inside the United States as well as outside of the United States. And this is a core value. We want this uh, to be able to continue to grow as a country and, and enjoy our freedoms. At the same time, um, I think that it doesn't really make sense to just think as a government without taking into account the people that represent that government or the corporations that feed that economy or the engineers that are actually building the technologies that we're all deploying for our own purposes. And so keeping that balance when we're trying to figure this stuff out, I think is really, really important, which is why I'm so impressed by this panel, because you actually have these four logics beautifully represented here, as, long as, as well as academia. And one of the things that uh, I'm really happy to see is, for example, the, um, what's been happening in Bletchley Park. We had all of these nations come together and make decisions about advanced artificial intelligence and what we are and what we are not willing to do as a human race. And so I feel like that piece is kind of the flip side of what we've been talking about, which is more the day-to-day -day regulations and how it affects us in the short term. I think we need to be thinking about this stuff in the short, in the medium, and the long term simultaneously. I think we need more incentives um, from government and other players to be able to take our time as we deploy things when it comes to procurement. I think it's incredibly important to make sure that um, the, the technologies that we're using uh, represent companies that also represent our ideals as Americans and as citizens of the world. All of these things are incredibly important. I want to salute, yes, the lawyers. You're all making a heck of a lot more money than the rest of us in, in all of this <laughs> stuff, honestly. Uh, but I also I, I want to send a, a, a huge shout out to the insurance companies, the insurance companies who are now having to literally back up big tech in saying, okay, you, you are putting yourself at risk, you might get sued if you deploy our models or if you use our data or if you use our generative technologies and so we've got your back. And if you've noticed, big tech has now started to create its own models of insurance. I think they might just become insurance players because that's where the money is. I see the lawyer saying yes, so it's probably <laughs> true. There you go. So that's where I'm coming from. That's wonderful. And I, I hope we're gonna keep you for just a little while, but I also, I wanna uh, pivot to a, a related topic so that we can get way in from Mark, Elon, and hopefully you again before you leave, as well as Albert and, and Christy. Um, one of the questions I often hear from entrepreneurial groups uh, and from people who are in business is, how can legislation possibly hope to keep pace with technology, with innovation, and how can we be sure that the legislation that's being drafted isn't two steps out of pace and going to hamper innovation and hamper the development of new technologies. And I'd love to hear from Elon or from Mark, whichever of you would like to step in first, about how you think about that. I think as a starting place, um, there's broad consensus that existing laws should be extended wherever possible to enforce against some of the bad outcomes of AI. I think that there's broad consensus around that. Um, I think that the next steps are a little bit, a little bit more opaque. I mean, you can you can try to predict and you can draft laws in a certain way that takes into account the way that the ways that technology might evolve, but it's it's impossible to it's impossible to predict where a technology might go. Um, I think one of the things that, like, as somebody who is now in the legislative in a legislative mindset, is um, is achieving a good and acceptable outcome rather than achieving perfection. Because if we go into if we go into a legislative mindset, it look seeking perfection, we'll just be debating all the time. And so there has to be we have to like find a good solution, a solution that achieves our goals in the near term, whether that's the short or the or the medium term, um, and and commit ourselves to regularly return to these laws and mm -hmm. adjust them where necessary. That said, there are certain instances where existing laws do not achieve the goals. Um, something like. Uh, assessing the provenance of training data on AI, on AI models. There's no existing law that governs you know, the provenance of training data. So 
I think there's, be, there's an element of, you know, adapting what already exists and an element of trying to predict what the future is going to be and finding, like, a good balance between those two. Okay. Yeah, what I'd say at the city level, I am really worried about how slow government is, about how hard it is to bring about change in government, about how many decades it took for us to adapt to the last major technological revolution, the transition to computerization. And I mean, there's still fax machines in the New York City government, <laughs> okay? So uh, we're not even done that transition from the 80s and 90s yet. I don't think there's punch cards in use, but I wouldn't be shocked <laughs> if in some basement there is. And it's, it's um, compounded right now by, I think, a real failure of imagination among government leaders. And it is very hard for the human mind to comprehend, to comprehend exponential growth. Mm -hmm. And um, what we're seeing now is a pace of change that government is just wholly unsuited to adapt to. And so we're graduating kids from public high schools right now. And probably 70% of those kids have zero days of computer science education. And maybe 0.001% have even one hour of machine learning training. And they're graduating into a workforce that is going to be transformed. We have a, a very large and robust workforce training uh, system in New York. And we're still training people to be medical receptionists and transcribers, jo jobs that are, are under threat already and, and will be in the years to come. I think there's an upside here. I think government's also bad at grabbing the upside. Um, and I, I want to caveat that I, I share the fears that Albert voices about complete loss of privacy, that you voiced about the rise of autonomous weapon systems and about the concentration of corporate power. I mean, some of these companies controlling the AI systems are going to be more powerful than governments. But I also see problems in government that could be fixed, that need to be fixed, that no one's moving on because we can't move fast enough. There's a 30,000 person waiting list right now to get reviewed for SNAP eligibility, food stamps. These are people in New York who qualify for food assistance who are just waiting for months because we don't have systems to process that, uh, that paperwork. There are examples like this throughout government. And I, I, I am constantly letting a fire under my colleagues to move faster to push your mind to imagine a pace of change that is far beyond what we lived for in the last 40 years. And I gotta say so far, mostly no one cares. And uh, I mean, the people in this room do, but um, uh, people's eyes glaze over when I bring this up. Um, I mean, your, your committee chair, Chair Gonzalez, is, is excellent. Um, and there are other leaders in government who, who get it, but, but too few, so we gotta push this hard. Yeah, I, do you want to mean? Uh, so I have a very nerdy coda to this, and that is we have examples of laws that can change to keep up with new technologies. You know, I served as an antitrust lawyer, and if you're an antitrust lawyer in the United States, the main law you work with is the Sherman Act, which I think is like 115 years old or something absurd like that, and it's just a couple paragraphs long. It is the dominant way that we regulate antitrust uh, uh, behavior in the US. We stop multi-billion dollar mergers with it. We protect competition, we protect consumers. And so there are a couple of procedural tweaks, and Ilan has heard me go on and on about this. I, and, and this is my sort of one-man crusade for changing civil procedure to make it easier to sue AI companies to make it easier to sue people when they're using novel technologies. Because what I think we've seen over the last few decades is we keep waiting to regulate very specific abuses by very specific technologies. And in the process, we, sh we basically insulate the people who are doing harm. And right now, it is almost impossible if you've been harmed by an AI system to get your day in court, even if that AI system is violating the Fair Housing Act, if it's violating you know, protections against employment discrimination, if it's violating other civil rights, because, well, you don't know enough about how that black box system works in order to bring your case, to get the discovery, to then actually win your case and to show you have the right to be in court. And so we've been working to push legislation 
modeled on the EU liability directive, which would create a rebuttable presumption against the defendant and says, guess what? If you're going to use a black box, if you're going to use these new forms of machine learning, the burden's going to be on you to show that the plaintiff wasn't harmed or to show that the system wasn't uh, violating the law. If you don't meet that burden, then you get discovery, you get information about how the model works, and that becomes a way to really change the incentives to say that if you're going to use you know, new forms of AI, you want to use the forms that are as explainable as possible, that are as lightweight as possible, where it's as easy as possible to rebut the allegations. Because if you don't do that, well, if I was still in private practice, I would tell my clients, put every risky choice you have behind an AI model. Because if you do, no one's going to be able to sue you for it, and no one's going to be able to get their day in court. Well, go ahead, Juliet. Very, very briefly, I think that we all need to do some form of a calculus of intentional risk to really ri weigh those risks and benefits. I think organizations in general, regardless of the type, do this um, strategically for the entire organization, but it's really fascinating to watch how AI, machine learning, all of the generative AI, um, there's, there's kind of this, this risk-benefit analysis that happens for the technology, but it's very, very limited. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to see as part of those weights um, things like, yes, are you going to get sued? Most likely. Uh, two, I'd love to see how much it costs when you deploy, in some cases, billions of dollars and it fails. Third, what about your reputation for a company like Google? That's going to weigh a lot more than the open AI that we knew last November when they launched. So what we're working on at our AI advisory is really creating uh, an auditing tool, kind of a SOC 2 uh, for the engineers in the house that, that really allows you to look at your technology responsibly, uh, and we can talk more about that another time, but I, I think that calculus of intentional risk is really, really important. Well, that's an incredibly great segue, too, because I was going to say I'd like to move us into talking about some practical ways to think about this transformation and how you as technology managers and leaders and entrepreneurs can be thinking about this inside the organizations that you're managing, leading, and building. Um, but I also want to give you the cue right now to start thinking about the questions you want to bring to this group while we have them assembled. This is an incredible group, as you already know. Um, what kind of questions are you starting to formulate? And get those starting to, to uh, articulate in your minds And as I ask this question, which is, and I'm going to pose it to you, Christy, first. How do we think about, as um, this is my work is around digital transformation strategy and about how organizations can get, the, get beyond the fax machine and into uh, you know, the <laughs> AI, AI era. Um, but how are uh, managers and leaders inside of technology organizations or inside of organizations that haven't used technology, which is pretty much everyone, how are they to think about this right now? What is different about this moment? What are some practical bits of guidance that we can give people as they're thinking about what's different about the way they need to think about building and scaling technology organizations at the moment? Yeah, so I'll talk about it um, from a people perspective, because at the crux of every organization are the people that you know can bring to life that which is impossible or deemed as such possible. Um, so you know, when we think about the future of work, we think about well, what are the different tasks that we can actually automate, not to remove the individual from the equation, but rather to have them you know shift. Their, their, their role and responsibility to where they can add additional value, right? So not thinking for the present, but thinking for the future. And I always, in, in the folks that I work with, we think about the job that we want to have, right? Six months, nine months from now, and not just how efficacious you can be in the moment, right? So that distribution of work is sort of like an 80-20 mixture. What can you do 80% well, and then 20%, how are you growing? And we build out, and I've seen a lot of tech companies um, invoke this, which is what is your stretch goal and how can we train you to, to adhere to that? So, you know, AI is not, not leaving. It's sort of a train that keeps moving. And if you're not hopping on it, then, then you're sort of missing your stop, right? Which you don't want to. You need to get to where you're going as quickly as possible. Um, then I think about it strategically, which is, um, you know, at, at least in the digital health space now that, you know, building a woman's health company, it's critically important that the data may, that we are capturing there's privacy that's maintained in ethics, not only in the infrastructure. So what about your software? You, you spoke about SOC, SOC compliance, HIPAA. There are a variety of different regulatory governing bodies. I would encourage you all, depending on the vertical that you're trying to create change in, 
understand what's being regulated. Equally important, understand the gaps, right? So you can prepare for those gaps. So we think about how we anonymize the data. In addition to the infrastructure, whether it be Google Cloud or AWS, yes, there's tons of encryption that you can leverage. But what about your data? Are you decentralizing? So that if there's a break in the system, likelihood of there being a break in any system is pretty high. <laughs> so, so think about how you can decentralize the information that you are actually capturing. Um, the third um, I'd like to chat about, which is you know, being part of larger organizations, there's a precedent for um, you know, how we protect the liberties at home um, and how we can also not curtail that which is innovation because clearly the innovation will happen even if governance is restrictive. It'll just happen elsewhere. Um, so you know, had the opportunity to see government, legal, um, regulatory within a company, outside of the company, getting external legal. When it comes to infrared technology, right, defense has had, and government, rightfully so, has had protections. The, the you know, two roads diverge, like Robert Frost poem, the, the government technology and consumer technology are starting actually to kind of merge, uh, and not just in terms of capability capacity, but also, you know, keeping people safe because we should all endeavor to keep everyone safe, right, regardless of shape, size, or color. So, you know, you know, we're seeing a lot of that collaboration across stakeholders, right, to save those liberties. But, you know, how do you balance that without, you know, curtailing innovation? And I think that's the challenge. And how do you do it fast enough when, you know, there's bureaucracy and, and procedures within companies, large, small, et cetera. So the agility um, is, is the last topic that I would say is a concern I would imagine for everyone. Yeah. Did you want to weigh in, Juliet? You look like you brought your microphone up, and we're going to lose you, so we might as well. I'm going to throw it open to the audience the, in just a the moment. The last so. thing that I, I wanted to share, a framework that I came up with uh, here at Columbia, was something I like to call the Apex Benchmark. And it was really looking again at that, that self-regulation uh, within organizations. And again, with all the best intentions, we start our companies and so on and so forth. As we get investors, we get more pressure. As uh, we go public, we get more and more pressure mm -hmm. as competition increases. And I love to use you know, um, Google uh, or Alphabet, if you prefer, and uh, OpenAI, simply because I think it really epitomizes the Apex benchmark as I view it. Essentially, you had Google, you had LLMs, large language models had existed for a while. They had them, uh, they, in fact, were very, very proud of them, but they, they decided not to deploy them for responsible reasons. And then a company comes around, here's OpenAI, and they launch. And nobody in the industry was really prepared for this. So what happens is everybody else, even though they're a small player, because they were able to get scale almost instantaneously within a matter of three months, we are talking about now releasing these models. So we saw Google do this, and they flubbed. They literally flubbed the ball because they were not ready and they had to do another relaunch. We're again, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars every time they launch. And the rest of the industry just decided to follow along. So again, at one point we had a certain benchmark for what was considered ethical in machine learning, in generative AI. One launches, drops the bar, everybody else drops. So that Apex benchmark, I don't think goes away. Yeah, regulating to the floor, I think, is uh, kind of the gist there. Who's got a question? I think um, Art had a microphone, right? Or someone has one. Oh, we got one over here. Who can uh, get to some of the folks here? Uh, there we go. Um, it is on, yeah. Yes. Um, so I had one. You guys um, talked a lot about cars, and I'm super into cars. And uh, um, you may know many people, GM Cruise is likely shutting down, is kind of what people are saying. There was an incident. They hit a pedestrian and dragged them for like two kilometers or something, which is not good. Um, and there's kind of Waymo in the US, and you were talking about you know, where the US wants to be a leader in that AI, and then you contrast that against China, where now you essentially only have Waymo and maybe kind of Tesla, but you know, in China you have Huawei doing this, you have Alto doing this, you have Xiaoping doing this, you have uh, BYD doing this, you have NEO doing this, you have so many of these uh, Chinese autonomous car things, and yet I don't know if it's the regulation or the fear of being sued, um, but autonomous cars feel like China will get there before the US. 
What's your question? Yeah, yeah your is there a question? Did the, did the regulation, is the regulation too much and are people too scared there and is go. it stifling the innovation because it's too regulated or too afraid of being sued and, and therefore China will basically have these better, more iterated things that will take all this into consideration later but we'll all be using Chinese tech in the future? What? I mean, yes, it's chilling the innovation. Why is that a bad thing, right? Because let's look at the case here. You had the San Francisco Fire Department going to a hearing by the Public Services Utility Board saying, please do not approve this test. These cars are getting in the way of 911 response. They are hurting people. They are not fit for service. We do not want them in one of the densest cities in the country, in one of the hardest to navigate cities in the country. And the board said, no, we don't want to chill innovation. They approved the deployment. And then you had not only a number of crashes, you had the woman who was pinned under a vehicle. She wasn't dragged for kilometers. It was, it was thankfully a, a smaller distance, but not only was she dragged by the vehicle after it was supposed to have stopped, after it was supposed to have you know, taken the decisions to preserve her life, but they then lied about it <laughs> to the regulators and hid the evidence. And yeah, I would say that, you know, the, I don't think that we should sacrifice people's health and safety in order to have a race to the bottom just because it's a flashy new tech. You could easily see the same thing with novel, you know, carcinogenic materials where countries with worse environmental standards are gonna allow people to develop something that's the next version of Teflon because they, they don't care about polluting the, the air with like high levels of really toxic chemicals. But that isn't a net loss to us that we're not the ones polluting our own air to become the market leader in that tech. And I, I don't think that, you know, really, I, I, I'm skeptical always that somehow we have to sacrifice our own civil rights, our own safety, our own, you know, quality of life in order to somehow just keep up with companies in China. I don't think it's a zero sum world in that, in that way. That's awesome. Do we have a different perspective or additional thoughts? Someone else? Uh, 2018, MIT, the moral machine experiment, right? This experiment that went viral, it was online, and essentially it posited um, something very simple. If you were a self-driving car and you didn't have a choice between hitting a person or hitting an animal, who would you kill? Which would you kill, right? And it goes through 13 to 17, 20, depending on when you decided to take the test, different versions. What they found at the end of the experiment of the analysis of all the data that, by the way, came in from 233 different countries, multiple languages, and very different kinds of people playing, what they found is that there are only three things that we, the world, can actually agree upon. One. Uh, we would prefer to save children as opposed to older people. But not everywhere. There are places like France and Italy where they valued older life more. Why? Because older people have more experience and as a result can lead, you know, for generations to come or at least, you know, kind of shape the younger people to, to have values that they all shared. Um, the other thing was that we tend to prefer pregnant women. We prefer to save the life of pregnant women versus non-pregnant people. Fair enough. And also that we prefer humans over pets. Ooh, what a concept. But ultimately, these are the only three things that we actually all agree upon. So when we talk about self-driving cars, it's self-driving cars for whom? Right? Where are you deploying these cars? And ultimately, how has this system been uh, programmed to respond? In other words, it has to make moral decisions. These systems have to make moral decisions, and they're based on the morals that they get coded, encoded into them, which is based on the engineers and the business logic and so many other things. So I think that these are all frameworks that we need to keep in mind when we you know, talk about innovation. I think, it, oh, sorry, oh yeah, I think as recently as last year, there were very robust conversations about AI alignment, right? Making sure that AI aligns with human values. And I think that the hierarchy of decisions that an, an autonomous car has to make, it is, there, there has not been a way to make those, to, to make like a constitution of driving, right? Where like, there's like a very clear hierarchy of how an autonomous vehicle should make decisions. I think another piece of this is that there's layered trust, right? That uh, drivers or users of any digital system expect the system to work well, and there's, and there's a certain layer of trust that they put into this. I mean, 
thinking about Tesla and the number of incidents that Tesla drivers have had on, on autopilot that has been grossly underreported. Um, I think it's a, it's, a very good, it's a very good example of the amount of trust. That, and then I think the, the other layer of trust is trusting software that comes from other countries. There's an incredible amount of distrust right. of software that comes from China. You see it with TikTok. Right. And I think that that is another reason why there's going to be, there are going to be serious impediments to adoption of Chinese autonomous vehicle technologies in the United States. But then there's also automation complacency. And on that note, I leave you all. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Give her a big round of applause. I'm going to go ahead. I, I'm going to actually take a different question unless you, you have something you really want to throw in here. Yes. Okay, great. Human drivers kill 2 million people a year globally and probably 200 plus just in New York City. So I'm not here to defend any of these autonomous systems, which I know very little about, but you cannot tell me that the status quo is acceptable. And uh, I'm just looking forward to us applying some of these same standards to human drivers, mm -hmm. <laughs> because it doesn't make the news when someone kills uh, a kid on a street in New York City. Uh, there are not protests about it, and we're not looking for big re revolutions in policy. Um, so let's keep the big picture in mind here. The goal ultimately has to be to prevent deaths on the street, and we're not doing enough on that right now. Awesome, awesome perspectives. Um, let's get the question, yeah, there in the back. <laughs> Hi, so two other, two areas that are kind of swimming around in my head that we haven't really touched on here, but that certainly seem to raise um, ethical and moral issues, um, and they're both so big, maybe this is like a lightning round. One is um, intellectual property where the New York Times, you know, the last two weeks launched a big lawsuit against Microsoft and OpenAI. I'm assuming that academia is very concerned about intellectual property protection. Um, we all should be as thought leaders. So how do you wrestle with that? And the other is um, workforce. So I've never met or worked under a CFO who didn't, you know, lick their chops at the prospect of automation and cost saves, which usually translates into job elimination. But we're at a whole other um, we're at a whole other level now um, that can have it seems like you know big impact big impacts on society. So how are you thinking about that? Who's thinking about this smart? Um, you know, do you see steps forward that are actually constructive? So lightning round on first let the IP piece the um, the piece around content that's being consumed as as the corpus. Uh, right. Machine learning is built on theft. <laughs> that, no, that's the lightning round answer. You're you know, taking huge amounts of other people's data and using it to create a product that rivals them in the marketplace, displacing their ability to make a living from using their own words, creating their own songs, animating their own videos. I mean, it is not fair use to generate a low-cost substitute of someone else's work using their own work in the process. Unless there's an agreement in place. <laughs> Unless what? Unless there's an agreement in place. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. An agreement in place, yeah. Uh, and then what about the, um, the future of work, the, the workforce, the labor displacement question? Uh, anybody want to try to tackle that a little bit? Sure. I mean, this keeps me up at night. And we have had incredible job disruption as part of every technological rev revolution. Uh, but the pace has never been this quick, and it's gonna make it much harder to manage the pain and to protect the vulnerable. Um, yes, potentially new careers could emerge. Um, that may be fine for the economy as a whole, but it doesn't help the person who's lost their job and has no source of livelihood. Um, and the fact that we are still training kids today the same way we trained them 30 and 40, 50 years ago uh, is indefensible for that reason. And we as a society, better be ready to offer much more robust social uh, supports in a time of rapid change, uh, or, or we're gonna be in a world of pain. Yeah, I'm gonna flip it on its head, which is, uh, not you to be clear, but just the topic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which is, um, you know, as we think about the future education of next generation leaders, uh, you know, just like there was an impetus to focus on STEM and STEAM, um, I know a lot of colleges are adopting and adapting the apprenticeship model, right? So how do you train for the job that you would like? Considering all of the innovation and impetus of leveraging AI, what is that new job? What is that current job that you can adopt and, and, and think about? In terms of the reduction in force, I mean, um, 
this isn't the first time that, that you've seen a series of reduction of force, it won't be the last, and so um, the goal of organization ought to be, again, how do you train for the next job and not just how do you, you know, meet the demands of the, of the current job. Um, and historically, we have responded to similar technological advancements by, you know, during the progressive era, having, you know, uh, caps on the number of hours people work, having minimum wage laws, having redistribution through a progressive tax system. We can, look, if these technologies provide a huge social dividend by allowing us to create more by working fewer hours, that can be this uto utopian vision but only if we're willing to actually have the hard conversation about how we redistribute those social dividends. And I, I, I can only imagine up in Albany how people would respond when you start talking about that. The word redistribute has certain connotations, <laughs> yes. And also to double click, if I may, I think the, the thought process on the cost of education and how we democratize that access to be able to you know, improve knowledge, I think that's also going to get revisited. Because um, still the price of education is actually a pretty high burden uh, for a lot, of, a lot of individuals. As I'm sure everyone in this room already knows. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are we at time? Or are we? I have a question. Oh, Art has a question. We have yes. we have a question in the front row, but we'll we'll let Art go first if that's okay. Are you willing to cede your your uh, space in line? Uh, well, <laughs> okay. You sure. Okay. So, I'm gonna pick up on, on on something that Mark said that I think is absolutely critical. Mark said, "No one cares. No one cares." And so, I, what I want to do is actually turn this question to the audience, and say, "How many of you care?" Like, who really here really cares? Do you vote? Do you write your representatives? So this is maybe not the norm, but so I want to double down on this because, you know, when you go to Somos, I mean, I, I'll tell you this is, Somos doesn't always have the packed room that we had this, this past fall for this topic. And in fact, this topic often doesn't attract packed rooms. And so the question is, how are we going to make people pay attention? And what is the loss of, what is our loss in not succeeding at that? I have an idea for a starting point. I think the starting point is making people aware of how pervasive these technologies already are in their lives. This is just something that we, we don't know how many decisions impact us that have been made by a machine and whether that machine considered the right data in making that decision. So I think the, the very first step is letting, letting people know the full breadth of automated decision-making systems that are already impacting your lives. And I think that opening the door in that way could get significant mileage at a very low at very low cost. Are you suggesting a law that requires disclosure of the use of AI for all consumer products? Excellent question. Some states already have such a law. The governor's actually the governor's policy on AI requires the office of ITS to inventory all AI uses that are in place in the state unless the agency secures an exception from ITS. So, and these reports, these inventories are supposed to be revealed publicly. So, we should hopefully be looking forward to a lot more disclosure around the types of systems that the state is using to make decisions around stuff like unemployment insurance, um, nutritional benefits, things like that. I, I mean, I would say that I, I, I'm flashing back five years ago, pre-pandemic, there was a convening about exactly these same issues. It was across the street uh, at, at um, the, uh, I think it's St. John the Divine, or, uh, and it was massive. You had hundreds of people coming out to workshops from dozens of orgs, uh, lawmakers were there, all of these different groups coming together to talk about these issues. I would say that a lot of people do care. What I think I tend to find is that a lot of people, when you go to a community workshop and you're talking about, there's just a lot of hopelessness. 
that we actually have a mechanism to affect meaningful change in the short term, but that there are parents who are terrified about how their kids are going to get a job, about how, you know, what this is going to mean for their f future, about the ways this is upending, you know, the way our world works, the way it's undermining democracy and the media. People are really scared. People are really, really do want a way to work on this. But I just think that we need to see the sort of critical mass moment where we start to make progress. And that's where we're going to see things really swell. Because, you know, Mark, Mark has heard me say this a bunch of times. I, I tend to think that the history of America teaches us that we will only do the right thing, the hard thing, the crucial thing at that moment when the cost of inaction is intolerable. Mm. And we're at that point where we are going to start to see much more mobilization just because it's simply intolerable to think of a future where these companies are you know, continuing to drive this type of change without any real accountability. Thank you. I'm gonna ask for the uh, 10 minutes, okay. Front row. Sure. You've been so, very patient. Thank yeah. you. So I think you guys are all tremendous. I think you've put a lot of thought into this. I have a couple of questions around, or one question around representation, right? So because you have a lot of good ideas and you're seeking to get representation in some form or another to make sure those ideas get propagated. And uh, you talked about whether it's legal or regulatory or legislative. And uh, what was discounted earlier was the sort of self-regulation and uh, you thought it didn't work. And I partially agree with that. It didn't really, doesn't really work at the corporate level, but there's a lot of uh, organizations that you know, sort of try to put like, a lot of these concerns into controls that we at the corporate level adopt. You know? And one of the things I notice is when I'm sort of participating in those as like a security uh, person representing how to manage controls and set up the controls, there is a space for ethics, but I don't see anybody in like sort of like your thinking in those forums. And I'm wondering if you think that you're properly represented where business is happening and business is setting up their self-regulation because I think what's happening is there's like a disconnect between your voices being heard where business is occurring as opposed to you thinking business don't, doesn't care about what you're saying, right? So can you respond to that? I mean, what I'll say is um, ethics is top of mind uh, for hardware, software. I think there's always what we call these objectives and key results known as OKRs, right? It's a framework to hold you accountable per quarter. Um, when you think about delivery of a product in relation to software models and ethics, there's a prioritization. Obviously, there's a spectrum, right? I'm not talking about the loss of life. I'm talking about a feature in, that's going to be deployed in a software system for this consumer advantage. Let's say um, face ID working as a hypothetical, right, with this level of efficacy and so forth. So um, it's not that there's a lack of representation. I think self-regulation is great insofar as you have someone self-regulating the self-regulation. And I think that's where we fall short, right? So you have these um, corporations, they have goals, they have objectives and key results, right? And there's a bottom line as to the outcome is, you know, what's your ROI for this year, for this product, for the next several years, right? We live in a capitalistic society, right? So at the core, it's dollars as a function of time, right, in organizations. And so, um, I do agree with, with our colleague that, that, that left a little bit ago that self-regulation is just, just not working. But I think the true answer here is it depends. Are there organizations that do it well? Yes. Are there organizations that don't do it well? We always need to improve. Yeah, and, that, and that's the point. Yeah. Right. I think that's why I was saying it doesn't really well work well at the individual company level because they have different goals. But a lot of times, so you know, I'll tell you the organization that I was looking at, which is uh, Cloud Security Alliance. So they develop like control sets and normally what ha happens is companies take those control sets into their requirements phase when they build out things. So 
Gen AI is a good example. Mm -hmm. uh, they're publishing a new set of requirements, and the thing that's being published is what companies will try to adhere to, right? And so the question is, are you properly being represented when in those forums that are producing those control requirements? Because I don't see it, yeah. right? I mean, I think the answer to that is no. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. I think that's where you should focus on because I think that's one of the legs of where you're seeking representation. And it's, it's an easy leg to participate in because when I looked at it, you know, I said, who is actually doing that work? And it's just a bunch of technology people that will volunteer to do that on your behalf and that have not thought about that problem. And like I said, I truly believe in the things that you're working on and the things that you thought about. But the question is practically, how do you get that into an implementation stage? Because you know, I look at that as the far left of the cycle and the farther right you go towards legislation and suing people and regula regulations, it's harder and harder to get those things agreed on, right? So, that's so I think saying. there's some hope that that's what this program yeah. in some ways is, right? Is right. getting that representation oh. into organizations uh, to help within business to be able to to lead ethically and and responsibly as well as you know effectively and efficiently. I, I think all of those things are are incredibly important and, and well observed. And I think it's a it's a good provocation. I, I do think that we we all are aware that there probably needs to be better, uh, you know, practices and protocols within business. And and hopefully that's what you all are are about to lead us to the next generation of. I, I want to. Um, begin to wrap up here in the last couple of minutes that we have with just a, a look into the future. As we think about, you know, we've had some good, some good questions and some good thought-provoking ideas about, you know, some of the ways that we're not prepared. Um, and, and I think we've also talked about some of the hope that we have about what, what AI and what, what some of these technologies can do for us. I'd just like to have you leave one thought with our, with our group here, remembering, of course, that they are going back into business and, and leading entrepreneurial, leading uh, leading entrepreneurially, and leading within business. Uh, what would you have people be thinking about as the kind of the, the bit of wisdom about how to think about the future of AI, how to think about what this is bringing to us societally, uh, you know, in, in terms of business and so on. I, I don't know who wants to take a jump at that. I can set up a, a premise, which uh, from my work is, you know, I think it's really important that we remember that there is no such thing as dystopia and utopia. <laughs> it is all just a mix of good and bad outcomes. And those, the futures that we face are all shaped by the actions and decisions that we make and take today. Uh, the decisions that we have made in the past, as well as the decisions we make today shape that future outcome. And you sitting here in this room and listening to this discussion is a huge part of shaping a better future. So I'm really grateful to you for that. I'm also really grateful to this panel. I wanted to just allow you to, to jump in if anyone has any last bit of wisdom that they'd like to leave, uh, either hopeful or cautionary. Um, you're, you're welcome to go either way uh, with, with your words of wisdom. Do you want to just run down the, the group here? Um, so I would say technology is not our destiny. Technology isn't going to shape a lot of these answers. It's going to be the choices we make as a society, as a democracy. And I think that oftentimes, you know, the way we make the change in this country, it, it's not going to be in DC. DC is so slow moving, but at the state and local level, you know, being involved, raising your voice, being part of those conversations, you can, impact change on a massive scale and you know for those of you in new york please you know stay local stay vocal be part of this conversation and help new york really set a model for the rest of the country the rest of the world on how we strike this balance and, and really create if not utopia a better topia better topia <laughs> like that chris you want to add something? yeah i would say i'm exceedingly hopeful the future is bright um um, you know, if not you, then who? If not now, then when? So I, I think it's important for you to see and assess every circumstance and put people at the very core, right? How are you living this decision and how is it influencing and impacting the future of people? So take the time to look ahead, reason back, and understand that the decision you're making does have outcomes, as all decisions do. 
And so, yeah, as I look out and seeing all of you, you put it so eloquently, which is this very topic in this very room with a lot of change makers already, right, have the opportunity and the power to work with people um, to make that influence, right? So I'm excited. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> Well, AI is a tool. It's a very powerful tool, just like electricity or nuclear power. And tools can be used to make the world better, and they can use, be used to inflict horrible pain and harm on humanity. And AI could be a tool to cure disease. It could also be a, a tool to inflict a horrific surveillance state on us all. Which direction it goes in depends on decisions that we make that we make as, as government and as citizens. And so let's act now so we make the right decisions so that we at least have a better topia. <laughs> That's the key word takeaway out of this. Elon. Yeah, and I just want to echo what's already been said today. Think about the people that your technologies will touch. Think especially about the least privileged, the least powerful, the, the under-asseted individuals that your technology will touch. Because if you can improve the lives of those people, you'll build trust and you'll build respect and you'll build a company that can stand the, the test of time. Excellent. Thank you to this panel for this incredible wisdom. Thank you. And thank you to you all for being here.